Luke chapter 13, and we'll be reading together from verse 6 to verse 9. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through to verse 9. I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we read the Word of God. I believe that shows respect to God's Word. Remember, this is a fireproof book. Amen? Yeah, somebody said amen. All right, let's read together, shall we? He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. And said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Wow. What an amazing story we have before us here. Um, we're going to talk tonight about the final ingredient for fruitfulness. They say that the Coca-Cola company guards its secret for Coca-Cola under careful lock and key behind vaults. And I don't know how much of that is fact and how much is fiction. I don't know. But they say that the ingredients are rather simple and that if, if word got out, if, if everyone knew how Coca-Cola was made, they'd just make it themselves. I imagine that if you do an internet search, you will probably find the ingredients of Coca-Cola. They say the same thing about Kentucky Fried Chicken all those different herbs and spices. It's a secret ingredient. And I'm told that the, uh, the compound that they use to roll the chicken in is all prepared in secret places and then shipped to the different locations. Again, I don't know fact from fiction. I just know what I read and it sounds interesting. But again, if anyone did a real careful internet search, you'd probably find out the ingredients in... Kentucky Fried Chicken. They don't call it that now, do they? Because they want to get away from that fried idea, so they call it KFC. Yeah. Same thing, though. Well, God has ingredients for being fruitful, for us to have fruitful lives, and none of them are secret. How about that? But there's one final ingredient we want to take a look at tonight. It may be staring us right in the face, and we want to look at that tonight. Let's pray first. Our loving Father, help us tonight to glean from your word. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding tonight that we may grasp and gain something that will help us, every one of us, to be more fruitful, fruit-bearing for you. Lord, please bless our lives uh, so that w when we get to heaven, we'll be so so happy, so proud that, that we let you be the husbandman, the, uh, the farmer, the vine dresser of our lives. Lord, please, tonight we pray that you would um, deal with us as, as only you can and uh, cut and prune or um, uh, care for us, Father. Do what, what we need in order to bring forth fruit for you. Bless the message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, uh, this morning we were talking about the 11th hour and getting busy being fruitful for the Lord, and it's still very, very true. Uh, I, I believe that Jesus' coming is imminent. That means it could happen any time. I believe that's the biblical position on believing about Jesus' uh, return. There are some Christians that don't believe that, and they believe that uh, we first have to go through the tribulation, and then Jesus will come back at the end. I don't believe that. There are some Christians that believe that we have to go halfway through the tribulation and at the midway point, then Jesus will come. I don't believe that. Uh, one of the, the reasons, for several reasons I don't believe it, but one of the reasons is that all you'd have to do then is start counting down the days. And then it doesn't matter how you live until that last day. Then, boy, you're going to be ready for when Jesus comes. Well, it doesn't work that way, folks. For in an hour that we know not, you see, that's when the Lord will come in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen. We have to be ready all the time. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus every day. That's imminency. Nothing has to happen, uh, prophetically speaking, uh, before Jesus comes back. It is the next event on the prophetic calendar. 
There's lots of prophecy yet to be fulfilled, but uh, not for the coming of Jesus. It could happen tonight. It could happen this year. And I think it, it's a biblical sound mind that says Jesus could come back this year. He could come back this month. He could come back this very day. I think that's a healthy way to live. And so we want to ask, well, how then should we live? If, if he could come back very soon, how should I live my life? If this is my last year, if he's going to come back at Christmas or he's going to come back in July, how should I live? And the Bible answers that and tells us that we need to be about our father's business. We need to be fruitful and busy for him. And so we were talking about that some this morning. And as we go through our Bibles and study them, we realize that everything that we have is a gift from God. Every good gift, every perfect gift cometh from above. God gives us what we have. Uh, every, everything we have, uh, we've been given uh, by God, and we'll leave it behind when we leave this world. All our treasures, all our time, all of our talents, all those things are to be used for his glory somehow. And now, it's a good thing that there's three time, talents, and treasures. Because someone says, well, I don't have any, any talent, and I don't have any treasure. Well, then you've got time. You've got just as much time as the rest of us. And you can use your time for the Lord. Someone says, well, I got time and I got talent, but I don't have any treasure. That's fine. Then use your time and your talent. Someone says, well, I got treasure, but I don't got any talent. Well, then use your treasure. I'm sure glad that there are three, but most of us are able to use all three in our service for the Lord. And I think that's very important. Now, these things, if you think about them, treasures, time, talents, they're just seeds that we sow that can, uh, we can plant them to bring forth eternal fruit for the Lord. But sometimes it happens that a Christian says, well, you know, I've been praying and I've been, I've been trying to serve the Lord, but nothing seems to come of it. I don't seem to bear fruit. Why is that? That's a, a kind of a common problem that happens to many of us as Christians. Uh, we sow our seed, but we don't seem to bring forth uh, any fruit. The reason might be a problem in the soil. Now, any good farmer will know that the soil has to be right. You've got to get the right kind of soil for what it is you're trying to grow. And uh, uh, different living things sometimes prefer different types of soil. I know that's very true with fish. There are some fish that uh, cannot live in fresh water, and there are some fish that cannot live in salt water. And even in the fresh water, it requires uh, different uh, conditions of the water and alkaline and, you know, this sort of thing and content of it. And uh, there are some fish that can live in very cold waters and some fish that can live in very hot waters and they, they can't mix. And so likewise, the condition of the soil is very important for the seed that we're sowing in there. Now, I suggest to you that um, a soil may be barren and lacking nutrients that are proper for its, uh, the, the growth of the seeds. Good soil has all of the necessary ingredients, whereas poor soil lacks those ingredients. Now, these ingredients include minerals, air, water, and organic material. Good soil has a high percentage of organic material and uh, plant nutrients which will turn the color of the soil, uh, sometimes dark brown, sometimes even black. I'm sure you've seen black soil. And this can be very, uh, very good soil. Good soil is also free from too many rocks and too many toxins that can harm the plants. Good soil is also deep enough so that the roots of the, the plant can spread down and spread out. Generally speaking, Organic matter and nutrients to the soil are the key to making good soil. Organic matter and nutrients. Now you might be wondering, Pastor, where are you going with this? Well, bear with me. This is where we use animal dung. Animal dung has the necessary organic matter and nutrients. 
animal dung, when we talk, when we talk of animal dung, we're talking of like cow, uh, ox, sheep, goat, chicken, dung. We're not talking about elephant or crocodile dung. So uh, animal dung has a much higher content of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus than does human waste. It makes a far better fertilizer. Now, we've got the story here in Luke chapter 13. The verses before it talk about how Jesus is warning the Jews and basically telling them, look at verse 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He recalls two stories where horrible things happened to certain people uh, in Israel. And he's using it as an example and saying, do you think that it happened to them because they're sinners above everyone else? And he says, no, no, you're thinking the wrong way. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Then on the heels of that, he gives this parable. And here's something to look at, please, in verse 7. He says, look at the words, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Now, how many years was Jesus' ministry? Three, or maybe even as much as three and a half. But just say three years. Huh. Very interesting. Here he gives this parable of a fig tree that wasn't producing fruit. After three years, it wasn't producing fruit. I wonder if there's a parallel there between the nation Israel and this fig tree. Here, Jesus, he's the Lord of lords and King of kings. And he came, you know, to, to Israel, presenting himself, saying, I am your Messiah. And he came unto his own but his own received him not. You read that in the Gospel of John. And for those three years, he was preaching salvation to the uh, Jewish people, the nation of Israel. But essentially, uh, when all, you know, it came down to the end, they said, we will not have this man reign over us. And then they said those horrible words to Herod, uh, I'm sorry, to Pilate, his blood be upon us and in our children. <sighs> Ay, ay, ay. And so uh, after the Lord Jesus uh, was crucified and rose again, uh, a few years later in around 70 AD, that's when Israel ceased to be a nation. They were uh, destroyed by Rome and they were scattered all over the then known world. Now it's still a miracle that they've survived these 2,000 years. Folks, this kind of thing doesn't happen. This is definitely an evidence of the hand of God. God is not finished with Israel. God is not done with his people, the Jews. He's put them on the back burner, he has, but he has not cast off Israel. And one day, soon, Israel is going to be on the front burner. The Lord Jesus is going to come and, and take his bride, his church, out of the earth. And then God's program for the earth is no longer going to be the church. It's going to be Israel. It's going to be back to Israel because that's what it was before the church arrived. It was Israel. That was God's program. The church arrived. Israel went on the back burner. The, do you know what I mean when I say the back burner? All you cooks out there, when you simmer something, you know, you put it on the back burner for now while you work on something else on the front burner. Here, I should talk. I'm no cook. Don't ever eat my cooking. You know, they say no man can see God and live. Well... <laughs> When it comes to my cooking, you know, no man can eat my cuisine and live. That's the way she goes. So my wife is the savior of the family. But we've got here uh, a story that I think parallels uh, the nation Israel. I think that's why Jesus gave it here. Right on the heels of these words, twice even, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then he gives this story about a man who owns this vineyard and he comes... And uh, in, the, in the vineyard is this fig tree. And so he comes looking for fruit. Why not? It's his fig tree. That's why you plant a fig tree, is to get figs. And so he comes at the proper time and no figs. He comes back the next year and still no figs. He comes back the following year and still no figs. And then he, he gets his, uh, his chief gardener and says, listen, this thing is not producing any fruit. Just cut the thing down. And that's when the gardener said, Lord, you know, wait here. Give me a chance here to dig all around it and fertilize it. And we'll see what happens. And maybe it'll bring forth fruit. 
But if it doesn't, then go ahead and cut it down. Well, as a nation, it didn't bring forth fruit. As a nation, it got cut down, so to speak. But God has not cast off Israel. And God knows what he's doing. He knows where all the Jews are all over the world. And at the right time, he's going to, he's going to bring them back to front stage center. Well, the grapevines, um, I'm sorry, the fig tree here was not producing any fruit and probably even the leaves looked kind of poor. Um, these, these plants require uh, soil that drains easily. And uh, so what the gardener was saying is, let me dig all around it. And I think what he was saying is, let me get the rocks out. Because um, uh, it required a, a looseness, uh, light soil. Uh, also, um, it required... Uh, um, a soil without clay. Got to get rid of the clay. So I think he was going to dig all around it. And then he was going to add the final ingredient. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. The final ingredient. And the final ingredient, uh, it says here, was um, uh, in verse 8, dung. I shall dig about it and dung it. Dung was the fertilizer. Today they got all kinds of different fertilizers. It's a huge business. But the final ingredient here in this parable, uh, in order for this fig tree to be fruitful, was fertilizer. Fertilizer improves the soil so that the fig tree can become fruitful. As I say, there are many types of different fertilizers on the market today, all kinds of them. It's become a huge science uh, involving trained chemists and uh, big business, and it requires expensive equipment to properly distribute it on the soil. Um, we lived for about six years on farmland when we were uh, in Ontario, and I remember twice a year, the farmer would get his massive big equipment, and this was a liquid fertilizer, and he would run this equipment up and down all over his fields, and you knew it because the wind blew the wrong way every time he did this, and we knew, oh, it's that time of year. Uh, but that's what he had to do. He had to fertilize his, um, his land if he wanted to get good crops. Now, in Jesus' day, they didn't have this great big machinery. What they did was they would fling the stuff with a shovel, is what they would do. Probably try and rake it as well. Boy, there's a lot of uh, man hours involved in that. In Bible times, dung was used mainly for fertilizer. That, so that you could grow good crops. That's what dung was used for. Remember, we're talking about the, uh, the waste product out of cows and oxen and sheep and goats and chickens and things like that. It was sometimes, dung was sometimes used as a fuel for fire when you wanted to do some cooking. There's parts of the world where they still do this. Say, so why? Why would they use dung to, to do cooking? Oh, isn't that just sound kind of wrong? Well, dung uh, is high in uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and all these things are flammable. And so they will take dung, dried dung, and they will burn it. There's some crazy thing that they do every year. Uh, they throw these cow chips, or cow pies as they call them. They harden, you know. And some idiot had the idea of making a game out of this and uh, throwing these things like Frisbees as far as they could. And it is so stupid a game that it is caught on worldwide. I can't imagine this being an Olympic sport, but um, there are people around the world that uh, play these uh, games with uh, dung. Uh, I, I, no more said there. But dung was used as a fertilizer mainly in the ground. I mean, really, what else can you do with dung? Because you can't eat it. Right? You can't eat it. You can't flavor your food with it. Right? Um, in the Bible, it was never used as a medication. Although, if you go on the internet, you will find that there are people who honestly believe that if you eat that stuff, it'll cure your cancer or cure your diabetes. And I don't want to go there. It's, but there are, are people who claim that. 
Uh, there was a book written in the 1700s, I believe it was in Europe, I believe, and they had some real quackery, doctory stuff saying that if you use dung, it'll help the children with their colicky stomachs, and if you hang it around their neck as they go to, to sleep at night, it'll, it'll help them. You know, if they're in a crying mood or something, it'll help soothe them. I don't buy that. You believe that? Ay, ay, ay. But that was a few hundred years ago. As far as I know, you don't use it as a medication to heal anything. You can't paint your walls with it. You can't beautify your house with it. Although some babies have tried to do that in their pen. Uh, if you were a dung salesman, then it might have some commercial value uh, as you so sold it to the farmers. Uh, but in Bible days, you, the farmers didn't buy dung. A thousand pound cow or bull will produce 82 pounds of dung every day. 82 times 365 is just about 30,000 pounds of dung a year. No one had to buy dung. Usually. So uh, you wouldn't want dung in your house. And uh, the farmer would have to remove his dung caked boots at the door and wash his feet uh, before entering the house. Otherwise Mrs. Farmer would have something to say about that. And so again... All I'm saying to you is the final ingredient for fruitfulness is fertilizer. And I think that is what the, 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 the dresser here in verse 7, the, the gardener, the husbandman, was saying to the owner. He was saying that it needs fertilizer. The final ingredient uh, for the vine tree, uh, uh, sorry, for the fig tree to bring forth fruit was fertilizer. That was the proper answer. Now, this may surprise you, but the Apostle Paul used dung to fertilize his fruitfulness for Jesus Christ. Now, put a little marker there in Luke, would you please, and go to the book of, of uh, Philippians. Go to Philippians. By the way, we're studying the book of Philippians on Wednesday nights now. And you will be delighted with some of the stuff in that wonderful book. Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> and we don't have time to go through all of the, the goodies in this chapter. But <clears throat> he's, um, he's talking about how that if any man had confidence in the flesh, he did. Uh, look at verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, by the way, on Wednesday night, when, as we, when we come to this portion, we'll go through it in much greater detail. You'll understand it all when we, we deal with it, but on Wednesday night. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those things, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but, what's that word? Dung, that I may win Christ. Very, very interesting. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things, I do count them but dung. Now as a Christian, you and I have to look at this world and all that the world has to offer as dung. That job you have, those people you work with, that cash flow, that paycheck you get, the things you spend your paycheck on, the physical things of this world, you have to look upon it as fertilizer. Dung. That's what Paul did here. And he used the dung to improve his fruitfulness for Jesus Christ. And it's kind of a mindset that we get as believers. As we get really focused on the Lord Jesus and upon heaven, we look upon this world and all that it has to offer as dung. You know, I was talking to one of the brothers today after service and uh, mentioning that these, uh, these entertainers that make us laugh or make us cry or, or just kind of, you know, give us a real good performance. 
pretty much most of them are not saved. And so then they die and they go to hell. There are so many comedians in hell. There are so many actors and actresses in hell. There are so many professional singers in hell. There are so many professional musicians, piano players, trumpet players, harpists, flutists. There are so many, many professionals in hell. It makes me sad as I think about it. People that can actually make me laugh or make me cry, great entertainers, then they die and they go to hell. That is so sad. That is so sad, isn't it? But folks, as we step back and we look at this world, this world really is at enmity with God. That's what the Bible teaches us. We have to look upon the things of this world as fertilizer. Fertilizer, that's what the Apostle Paul did. Uh, everything that this world has to offer us is fertilizer in order to help bring forth the most amount of fruit for our Heavenly Father. Fertilizer will not be going to heaven with you. You are not taking fertilizer with you. You may uh, love that car, love that boat, uh, love that um, cash flow, that paycheck, that vacation, that house, those pieces of furniture, those dishes, that silverware, uh, those nice clothes in your closet. All of the things, you will not be taking them to heaven with you. You're going to leave them all behind. Everything, everything, everything is going to be left behind because it's fertilizer. And you don't take fertilizer into your home, do you? It stops at the front door. And the Lord will not allow fertilizer or dung, for another sake of another term, he will not allow that stuff into heaven. Otherwise, you'd be pulling a U-Haul trailer behind you when you went to heaven. You'd have some kind of cart. And you'd be taking all of your goods with you. Some guys actually have the crazy idea of thinking that they can take their money with them to heaven. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to work. Uh, all of these things of earth are going to be left behind, left behind. And we got many examples in the scriptures that teach us that. And so uh, God will not allow us to take any fertilizer up into our mansion, up through the pearly gates. He will not allow fertilizer into heaven. We leave it all behind. You wouldn't want to track dung into your heavenly home. You wouldn't want that. You've heard the story, I'm sure, about the guy who wanted to uh, take his money to, to heaven and he had this opportunity somehow and he, he sold everything and bought gold. And he got all this gold. He, he, he had um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and he converted it all into gold and he was able to take it with him to heaven. And when he got there, he was so happy that he had his wealth, he had his gold with him. And then uh, as he got there, he realized that the streets are, are gold. And someone said to him, what do you got there? And he says, it's gold. And they said, gold? They said, what do you, what do you want to bring asphalt you know, into heaven? That's what we pave the streets with. And that, that, kind, of, that kind of mentality, it's, it, that's heavenly mentality, folks, where we, we look ahead and we, we consider everything of this world to be nothing more than fertilizer. I think that God has blessed us in so many ways and given us so many things. Why has he done it? So that we can feather our nest? So that we can comfort ourselves in wealth and luxury? I don't think so. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of comfort. You know, a few nice things. There's nothing wrong with that. Even the Lord Jesus had a couple of nice things. There's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, it's wrong if we get our hearts and minds and eyes on the things of the world. We know that's wrong. Then it can become like an idol. But otherwise, we've been given these things in order to glorify God with. And so they become fertilizer, is what they, they become. And I like to suggest to you that this is the final ingredient, folks. The final ingredient to being a fruitful a uh, Christian for God is a mental decision. A mental decision to count everything as dung, to be used as fertilizer, to make you more fruitful in life for the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look at one more scripture if you go back to Luke. In fact, go back to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10.
we have here in this chapter, starting in verse 25, an amazing story the Lord gave. And we'll pick up, um, it actually goes through to verse 37, but we're going to pick it up uh, here and say verse 29. Um, but he willing to justify himself uh, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jericho, to, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. That's quite a wound if you're left half dead. I'd say he got a real thumping. Verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, and remember, those Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They looked down their nose at the Samaritans. Ooh. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. All this was at the expense of the Samaritan. So far, so good? Are you with me? Yes? Right. This Samaritan was using what he had, his time, his talents, and his treasures, as fertilizer. He was using it in a very practical, active way as fertilizer in order to bring glory to God. And on the morrow, verse 35, on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence. Now remember, we learned today that one penny was a day's wages. So two pennies is two days wages for the working man. And so if the working man today may be making $100 to $150 a day, this could be from two to three hundred dollars that uh, in today's currency that he would have given. He took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. So here the Samaritan took his time, his talents, and his treasures, all three, and used them as fertilizer for the glory of God. Now, some say this was just a parable. Others say, no, this was an actual happening. Point is, there's a lot of good truth here for us, especially if we're going to look at as an example of fertilizer that can be used in life for the fruitfulness and glory of God. A few years ago, uh, in Vernon, B.C., where one of our missionaries uh, is laboring, Brother Richard Allen, um, the police were called... um, Uh, in to to help with something. Apparently, there was a lot of cash, money, that was blowing around in a parking lot. This doesn't happen every day. And uh, the hero was an anonymous lady who stopped and ran around and gathered up as much of this money as she possibly could, and she gathered up about $2,000 of it. That was all that she could find. She gathered it all up, and she bundled it up, and she left a note, and she took it to a, um, uh, a nearby business and called the police and told them what she had done and how much money was there. And they said, well, who are you? And she says, no, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want my name. I want to remain anonymous. And then she hung up the phone, and she took off. So she's being called a hero. And she, uh, she looked at that money, And she looked past that money, didn't she? Now, some people would have just looked at the money and stopped there and says, whoa, i got to have that, man. And then they would have gathered up this money and put it in their pocket and off they would go. She looked past the the money and she realized that someone lost that money. And so thinking, well, how would I feel if I lost the money? So this is what she did. She saw the greater good. She invested her time and her talents. Um, She didn't have to invest any money there, but she invested her time and her talents there to gather all that up and to do what she did. And as it happened, there was a businessman who had lost that money. And that money was an important deposit 
in the bank to be made in the bank for his business and he lost all the money. And so he was just going out of his mind. And then she found it and she did this and now she's being hailed as a hero. Did you know that when you use your time, your talents, your treasure as fertilizer for the glory of God, you are earmarked a hero in heaven because the world won't do that. The world says, what are you doing? You're going to church on a Sunday morning on, and again on a Sunday night on a beautiful day like this? Are you nuts? That is a bad investment of your time. The world just doesn't get it. They don't see past the time. The world looks at you when you put in your, your tithe, when you put in your support for missions, or next week when you put in your sacrificial gift for Sacrifice Sunday, and the world says, are you out of your mind? Are you a lunatic? Do you want to end up in the poorhouse? What's wrong with you? You don't have a brain. You've got a chunk of coal up there. Normal, sane, rational people don't do that kind of thing. No. The world doesn't get it, do they? All they see is the money. They don't see past the money at all. They don't look upon money as fertilizer, do they? They don't look upon time as fertilizer. And when you use your talents for the Lord, and you serve the Lord in some kind of ministry, they say, oh, you're crazy, you're dumb, you're stupid. Let others do that. Don't you do that. Don't you lift a little finger. Let other people do all of the serving, not you. They don't get it, do they? They can't see past that. All they see is just what's right there in front of them. They don't realize that this stuff in the eyes of heaven is just fertilizer. Here's the missing ingredient for the, for the soil. And this may be why sometimes a Christian won't see much fruit in his or her life is because they, they need to add the missing ingredient, the final ingredient. They need to add the fertilizer. But in order to do that, you've got to come to a, a point and make a mental decision that the things that you have in your life basically are fertilizer. They're to be invested in the ground. They're to be invested for God's glory. And not every Christian, I think, is going to come to that realization. But the Christians who do, like the Apostle Paul did, will get great glory and rewards in heaven. Because folks, don't forget, the very shortest, tiniest, little slippery piece of our entire eternity is the 70 years that we spend here on this world. The Bible talks about us having three score and ten, 70 years. Some of us don't even get that. But we think, oh, oh man, I, I got 20 years left, or I got 50 years left. Oh, well, what am I going to do with them? Boy, this is going to be great. And you get right down to the day the net tomorrow is your 70th birthday or something, and you, you know, you're reading the scriptures, you know, three score and ten. Ooh, 70 years and that's it, huh? Wow, my last day on the, on the planet, is that right? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is this. We're not living for this world. We're living for the next life, the next world. The things that we have, we can either look at them and, and gloat and be greedy over them, but in God's eyes, all they are is fertilizer. It's just dung. What do you do with dung? You invest it in the ground, in the soil, so that you can bring forth fruit for God. The missing ingredient, the final ingredient, and it's a decision you have to make. Let's bow our heads for prayer.